So thank you all for watching this video, which, uh, unlike my previous videos so far, is not going to be purely about public transportation, but about an issue that is very intimately related to transportation, uh, which is housing. In fact, many uh, countries even merge the two uh, functions at the ministerial level. So Germany is not one of them. Germany has separate it has a Ministry of Transport that does not have control over housing, but there are other countries uh, that do. Uh, I believe the Netherlands merges them, uh, and at this point I think France has merged them as the Ministry of the Ecological Transition. Um, so some countries, again, some countries merge, some don't. Um, but, um, but, but they're clearly very intimately related issues because transportation shapes where people go. Um, conversely, housing shapes where people live and therefore where you're going to serve your public transportation system. Um, and so, um, for example, and, and so, for example, I'm going to start by looking at Sweden for a little bit before I'm going to go to my main theme, which is New York, because Stockholm is a very good example of integration of the two. I, I was talking before about the ministerial level. Uh, Sweden, I believe, does not merge these two. So I believe in Sweden they have separate ministries for uh, transport for transport and for housing, and it's still very integrated. Um, so. Um, you might notice something, and it, it might not be visible if you go to more to the central part of Stockholm. I mean, this is the central part of Stockholm. This looks like a European. This is, gonna, this look, this is how a European city looks on Google Earth. Uh, and if you were to go on street level, it would look like a European city at street level. Um, blocks, mid-rise housing. Um, Stockholm is maybe a little bit more regularly gridded than the average, but it's not New York. I mean. Broken grid. I mean, the grid. You can see the, the parks breaking in. The, the parks that go off grid. The different neighborhood grids. Not as regular as anything in New York, let alone let's say Chicago, um, Toronto. And um, so, uh, so the central parks aren't going to look very unusual to you. It might much look like any normal European city, but um, once you go to the more suburban part. You might notice something. Um, so even here, so this is still within city limits. It's called south, the, the south of Stockholm, uh, uh You might notice that there's more gray near where the subway goes than in between. And if you zoom in, it is especially, this is not some kind of a blind finger plan, um, like in Copenhagen, where it's also integrated. They did something very good here in Sweden, which is, um, they built the subway in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and that is roughly when they also built all the public housing. So you might notice um, that, so for example, here in Fashta, um the public housing like, has neighborhood centers that are oriented immediately around the train. Now, this is with a lot of parking. Um, sometimes they have this, sometimes they don't. So the parking is obviously not very transit oriented. Um, and here, for example, they don't have the park and ride functions. Um, the, the actual term is Fasta Strand. And, um, and you, and you kind of know, you, you have all these housing projects, and not all of them, because here, for example, not, they, they don't, but you might notice that the biggest things face the station. So here you have these, what are called big buildings in Sweden, um, that either are immediately next to the train station, or next to streets that feed the train station effectively. Now, again, here it's going to be parking because this was built by people who did not think cars were bad. They thought that the working class couldn't always afford cars. It's 1960 in Sweden. Um, so people should be provided with options. So um, parking, buildings that are not uh, street-facing. Come on, no, this is the street. The buildings face sideways. Um, it, it, as is common in Europe, also sometimes in parts of America where they still have these Kind of blank, uh, these kind of not blank, these traditional street walls, um, the sides of the buildings are blank, um, or, or almost blank, uh, almost blank because historically you would expect to have more buildings here, and even when it's not, I mean, they're got used to something. Um, but these, of course, face the street. So you might notice, I mean, I mean, this is all about getting people to the train station. Farther from the train station, smaller buildings. Um, so it's very tightly integrated. Um, and this integration, has 
amazing results. Um, the proportion of trips in Stockholm, not the city, the county, this is effectively the entire metropolitan area going to places that you can even look on a map are different. Like Norrpelje here, that's that's not contiguous. This is a suburb, um, a, a, a rather uh, well-off suburb, uh, this entire area, that has a freeway. There used to be a train. Uh, it doesn't go there anymore. The trains uh, do go to this area, but not, uh, it's called Utslaxpan, but you can kind of see it's not not everywhere. Um, so, to, so, yeah, in Korsta there's a train, but in uh, Norrpelje, um, I think there used to be, and there no longer is. Um, so you have an expressway, because these are rich people, they have cars, that gets you to the city. Um, and yes, there is parking in the city. Uh, and so, um, in this entire region, 40% or so of trips are done by public transportation. Um, I can't tell you the exact model split in the language that I understand, which is work trips, because Sweden is like Germany, it reports all trips, not work trips. So you need to do some interpolation to compare that with work trips, which is how things are reported in the US, Canada, uh, Britain, France, uh, Korea, that's not Korea, Japan, Singapore. Um, so parts of Europe are like the so parts of Europe do it the American and Asian way, parts of Europe don't. Um, so it's very tight integration, and this is remember, so we're talking about 40% in a region where, first of all, there was never car suppression. There was never any auto suppression in Stockholm. This was not an Eastern European place. Uh, second, um, it's a very wealthy place. Um, third, it's not a large city. Stockholm, metropolitan Stockholm, has two and a half million people. Um, and they have the model split of Paris. Paris, Paris which is a mega city, does about as well as Stockholm. So this is a very important kind of integration, which is unfortunately not possible this side of the 1960s. The public housing projects have been built. Lots of, of course, private housing. Um, this was, of course, tightly integrated with transportation as well. Um, the transportation that it was integrated with was, ca um, was cars rather than, um, rather than public transportation. But this was still integration. Um, so in New York, this was Robert Moses. Um, who made in, who had an integrated transportation and housing plan. The system was as follows. People should travel by car ideally exclusively. Um, and therefore, um, they should work in the city, live in the suburbs. Um, so even though by, at the time that most was active, so that would be the 1950s, early 60s, job sprawl already was starting Moses opposed the concept of job sprawl. The con I mean, not in these terms, but the idea was that the city was the important agglomeration. Um, it had good benefits like agglomeration. It had negative problems like um, racial minorities. Um, Moses himself was Jewish, but um, most people who had this mentality um, also to a, to a large extent viewed um, Jewish people and Italian people also as a social problem, but they could be integrated and assimilated and turned into proper white Americans, like Moses himself. Um, and black people were, I mean, to be segregated away. Um, so this was an urban social problem at the time. Um, the, the presence of people who made, uh, the, who made racists feel uncomfortable. Uh, but there was a solution. Suburbs where normal people, i.e. white people, live, they drive to work in Manhattan, and of course, not just in the suburbs. Of course, there was housing being built in New York at the time. New York barely depopulated in the 50s, and actually, I, mean, I think, lost maybe 1% of its population, maybe less, and it recovered in the 60s. There was no population loss between the 1950 and 1970 in New York City. The population loss was in the 70s. Um, but, I mean, people were, were leaving the central parts of the city, and they were moving farther out. So lots of housing to be built, in uh, eastern Queens, uh, southern Brooklyn, Staten Island, the North Bronx. Um, and it was all oriented around the car. So zoning codes, for example, mandated parking. Um, there were, in fact, sample zoning codes distributed by the federal government in the 1920s 
Um, and I believe that I was, uh, so at the time, I don't think the Department of Transportation existed, neither did the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, which is a 1960s creation. So this was handled by the Department of Commerce under Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, who later became a president. Uh, and as Secretary of Commerce, he first of all promulgated the U.S. highway systems, so not the expressways. This was older talks. This was just two-lane, sometimes occasionally four-lane um, roads with at great intersections between all the major parts of America and also um, internal to counties. Um, and sample zoning codes that included separation of uses, because if on the same street there might be commerce and uh, residential uh, uses, then it is bad. Um, mostly, again, I, I, much more of this history is racist or uncomfortable than, than people would admit. So in New York, the official history is that it was because um, there might have been a, a polluting industry, but New York did not have polluting industry. New York built uh, garments. New York had a garment industry. I mean, this is not a polluting industry. I mean, the steam engines for it might be polluting, but the steam engines are going to be going on. The steam engines are equally going to be present for home heating, um, for cold heating. And, and so it's not, it was not a steel plant or anything, it was just swat shops. And second, there's something called the Equitable Building in Lower Manhattan. Um, that I'm, not, I'm not going to find the exact address. Um, it is going to be this. Wait, what? No. Equitable Building. And it's on uh, it's on Lower Broadway in Lower Manhattan. Um, in fact, I've been there. Um, it is this one. So uh, this building is from the 1910s, and the and there were complaints that it was uh, rising vertically from the street wall. So the height of the building. So this is 165 meters on the street. That's uh, 10. So 155 meters like this, um, more if you include the harder part, uh, the, the, our setback. And so about 155 meters, they would take, uh, and the street was only about 20 something wide. So a very large ra ratio of building height to street width that was supposed to be the complaint. And if you read the official history of New York City zoning, they will emphasize this and the zoning law from New York in 1916 did actually talk about this to the point of requiring buildings to be uh, somewhat uh, set back. So instead of rising vertically, um, they were built. So buildings were built based on the envelopes set in the original zoning code of 1916 might include the Empire State Building. You might notice it doesn't rise vertically. Um, like the, the first couple of floors do, but then it um, tapers the ziggurat. So the, the ziggurat form that was popularized by the code. So that would be things like the Empire State Building and um, the Chrysler Building. But for the most part, um, it's the Chrysler Building, not this. Um, and, but for the most part, the main reason for this, and the, so the main thing that people were complaining about at the time, and the reason for youth separation of residential, commercial, and industrial zones was not fears about what we, what, what, what we today consider pollution. They were fears about racial pollution. There were fears of sweatshops, um, whose employees were mostly Jewish women, uh, going to locate, that they were going to locate, right next to all the really high-end stores that sold the clothes that they made, which were on Fifth Avenue. Um, so they worried that um, if they didn't separate the uses, then someone would just build sweatshops right here, right next to all of these high-end stores. And again, this was not going to be polluted. The, the issue was not pollution. The issue was racial pollution. The issue was that all these rich wasps that were going to shop for really expensive dresses and really expensive suits were going to see Jewish garment workers on lunch break. This was essentially an upstairs-downstairs kind of zoning. And this is... Uh, so, so this was not about transportation. Don't get me wrong. This was just about racist people not liking Jews, um, which again, I mean, that was with the 1910s, uh, this changed by the 1950s and 60s to white people not liking black people, not wasps not liking Jews and Italians. Um, but, but a lot of it was racial pollution concerns um, for zoning. And then in the 20s, as cars became more and more, more and more of a thing, 
um, they connected this kind of zoning, so youth separation, uh, ideally single family. The idea, even before going back to the 1860s, the idea was that build, living in an apartment building was no way for an American to live and people should live in houses. Um, it's just that they never actually did that zoning until the 1910s. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, the historic American engineering record, which I constantly cite as a source on the subway. So that would be... So I constantly recommend this. Yeah, they, yeah exactly. They, they lived in single-family houses. Honestly, even today, there's some single-family buildings on Fifth Avenue. It's just they're single-family, six-story buildings. No, I do not want... Uh, wait, how the hell do I... I never... The problem is that I never know how to ban someone. Uh, how do I, what do I click? And I know, I know I've done this before, so I know that it's something that is possible for me to, uh, ban. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, so, so yeah, at this point, some of them live single family, but only the absolutely wealthiest. And even then the absolutely wealthiest try to stay there until eventually their areas commercialized and they were replaced by uh, um, higher and higher uses. So for example, um, the Astoria Hotel um, replacing uh, residential and then the Astoria Hotel gets replaced with something that packs people a little closer. Um, and, uh, and so the um, and so, going back to the 1860s, this is the Historic American Engineering Record, which I, I especially recommend these two. So, um, the uh, New York Rapid Transit Decision of 1900 and the impact of the IRT in New York City. I recommend that you read both of them um, because, uh, because they talk about the social issues regarding the construction of the so These are just engineering. But, um, so these talk about how the patricians who ran New York w w um, hated the city. I mean, I mean, they didn't think of themselves as the civic leaders, but they hated how people lived in the city. They, they hated the people of the city who were not like them. And um, they hoped that the subway would open up new land to turn into single-family housing, to, to, to turn into single-family housing. Um, and it didn't because, by, because they wanted to build a subway in the 1860s, but they lacked the technology to do so. London had a subway, but it was steam powered, and the and the geography for that in New York was unsuitable. So eventually, they so between that and between um, lots of politicking between them and um, Town Hall, um, it took until 1904 to build a subway. And by then, New York was legendarily overcrowded. I don't think the, I mean maybe Colon World City has exceeded the densities of uh, the Lower East Side at its peak, which was around the time the subway opened. Um, but um, so so they built L's, but they were steam powered, so they uh, were very noisy on the street. They uh, were polluting on the street. They were also not very fast. Um, so then, but the subway, they, they hoped that it would open up single family land. But by 1904, when it opens, it's not, not going to get you to single family land. I mean, all the stuff that was built by the subway. Um, for example, the Columbia dorm that I used to live in. I just I'm just giving that one because I know the year it opened. Um, so that was. Uh, so this building is where I lived, 503 West 121st Street. Um, this building um, is from 1903. Um, so it is, uh, I, I, for all, all this time I thought it was an old low tenement because I didn't know what old, what real old low tenement looked like. No, this is a new low tenement. Um, and so, uh, so these are, I think these are, these might be old, I'm not sure. Um, this would, these would be new law. I mean, if it's if, there, if there's a way for if there's a way for you to extricate the trash, it's always no. Um, so the new law. So this is a new law tenement that was built 1903. The subway was built 1900 to 1904. So at the time they built it, they knew the subway was going to get here. I think Columbia moved into this area. I want to say um, right as the subway began being constructed, and you can see this is a this is an apartment building. This is a six-story apartment building. And um, 
the and, and again, I, I don't know the years of construction of all of these, so maybe some of these are newer, but they were building six-story tenements here. Um, and the reformers who hated the city, the kind of people who are, wrote and read how the other half lived as a social problem, they flipped. They didn't realize that they thought this was terrible, we need to build more subways, and of course, but, and of course, this did not help. People kept moving to the city. Um, so zoning was, again, it was not single family zoning in New York in 1916. They had density restrictions in 1916, but they, I don't, but, but single family zoning is a little bit newer than that and was not a big thing in New York until 1961. Um, but they did try to make the city more auto oriented as cars became more of a thing in the 1920s, um, through the construction, through the construction of some early roads and then starting in the 1930s, the various parkways and then the expressways. This was always about integration of transportation and housing development. And um, now this integration began being broken in the 1960s. Um, essentially, the government lost purpose. Um, the goal of suburbanizing America was already achieved. Um, even before the interstates, by the way, most Americans own cars. Um, I'm forgetting the exact point at which most households own cars, mostly because um, I only have the data at the level of vehicles per capita. At the end of World War II, it was, I believe, 220-ish. So about the same, so slightly less maybe than New York City today. Um, but maybe the households were a little bigger. So it's possible that the shift happened just after World War II. Um, the, the hitting the 50% point, and um, this has been stagnant since the Depression, so already in the late 1920s, um, a, a very large minority of Americans own cars. Um, and that turned into a majority, um, and they used the cars for everything, and um, the suburbs were the more um, prestigious place to live, and um, then they kept saying, oh wait, we have problems in our cities, like crime is rising. Um, housing quality is still low. So let's build do let's, let's build better housing. Let's do um, let, let's federalize this with um, housing and urban development with, with the HUD department. Um, let's also try to invest also a little bit in public transit. It was never systematic. This is on me, and this is by the way where you see a lot of traditional rail fans. You see a lot in the traditional rail industry who keep saying the transit is underfunded, which remember is incorrect. The United States never under, underfunded public transit. Much money was spent. Much money is being spent see previous videos on that or see anything I write on a blog about public transportation and construction costs. The United States does not underfund transit, it underplans transit. There was never any kind of integrated decision saying anything along the lines of, yes, in America we're normative people, it was in the late 1960s, we're normative people, normative people drive, but in the largest cities this does not work, so we will do the exact opposite in New York, so we will plan New York around, it, around the subway being the primary uh, mode of transportation, or, um, public transportation being the, mo the main mode of transportation. They were moved in that direction. They were always haphazard. Things like setting up bus lanes. The road builders loved bus lanes in the 60s. They hated rail. They loved bus lanes. Um, and uh, let's also maybe do commuter rail. Let's also integrate design of, of, this, of the suburbs around commuter rail. This kind of decision never happened. There was never any kind of housing commuter rail integration. Um, and so this uh, and, and nor was there any attempt to do TOD. The term TOD is much more recent um, and has been done in extremely haphazard ways. I don't think ever in New York City, always in uh, new light rail cities, like there are some examples in San Diego, some of which look semi okay and emphasis look semi okay. There are very few examples of good TOD on America. I mean, it's always one patch of something, like, like a, a few blocks of something in the, in the Virginia suburbs of Washington or something. Um, nothing as systematic as Stockholm or even Vancouver. Um, so, so the point is that transportation and housing are always related. So the question is, okay, so there's this zoning code in New York that went through so many layers of accretion, um, some of which are pure racism, some of which are people trying to make the city um, auto-friendlier um, or the region auto-friendlier. Again, Robert knows this. They did. You live in the suburbs, you drive to the city. Um, and, uh, and again, it's got layered with things, like maybe you drive to a park and ride, so at this point, the uh, commuter system is entirely about park and rides. I mean, people tell me, oh yeah, I drive to, I 
different parking lot is better or if the prices are better. Um, and uh, and stations were open and closed based on that. So for example, the busiest commuter rail station in the United States, not to say terminal station, is Ronkonkoma. Um, this is the land use on Ronkonkoma. Um, so first of all, note something important. So first of all, it's very far from the city, but it's a big city. Okay. So let's look at what's the station to the train station. It's exclusively parking. It's not development. Um, there's the airport on one side, um, but the airport is not oriented around. So first of all, it's a small airport, but it's not oriented around the train. Um, the, um, the the main buildings don't face that. The, this is the terminal. So the terminal of the airport is literally on the other side of the runways from the train. So it's not oriented around the train. It's just I just occupies land. Um, now there are houses on the other side of the tracks, um, but let's but, but note something. These are single family houses, so right next to the station, you already see single family. And it's not because closer in, it's apartment buildings now. I mean, it's a little bit. I mean, it, it's here, but but this is this is a parking structure. This is not an apartment building. And um, and here it's um, it looks like a truck stop or a bus stop. Um, so at no point is there any attempt to enable people to live near the train station. And if they enable and not get, because it's not that, because the issue is that it's illegal, okay? If I'm a developer, maybe I would, if I'm a developer, and I'm not going to pick Rock because it's too far away, but if I'm a developer um, and I have money, I'm not going to go to, let's say, Mineola. Mineola is also good because it, um, it's one of the very few jobs centers on Long Island. Um, I'm not going to go to Maniola, and uh, so, so Maniola also has some traditional buildings. Um, I'm going to go to Maniola and say, okay, I see this land very close to the train. Um, let's pick this block. And I'm going to redevelop this as mid-rise housing. Um, and not like there's a couple adjacent buildings, just actual mid-rise housing. Okay, this is a block with, uh, so this is a block. Um, let, let's look at the size. Um, no, I don't want it in square kilometers. It means nothing to me. Uh, this is 8,000 square meters, um, a little less than a hectare. Now, um, the um, size of the Manhattan block, um, the interior size, is 200 feet by 800, um, which is um, 160,000 square feet, which is a little less than 16,000 square meters, about 1,500-ish. 15,000 15, square meters. This is about half a Manhattan block. Um, and Manhattan block density, um, not even like new TOD on the Upper East Side type of density, um, the, that trad building that we're talking about before, or things like new autonomous. Um, I mean, I can pack in, into, this, in, into this density, um, it's probably like a hectare with all the adjacent, with the, all the adjacent, adjacent stuff around it. Um, 500 people, but the, the 500 residents. More if you're doing, um, more if it's like, like the really massive housing projects or the condo towers of the Upper East Side. Um, and so, but I mean, if I'm a developer, I can't do that, and it's illegal. There's zoning, I can't, I can't build to high density. Um, and, and so things that are very close to the train station are already single family. I can't buy a couple of these and make them bigger. Um, so, it's, so this is why I'm saying enable on coerced. I mean, it is coerced right now that, that people live like this because um, a developer can say, huh, we have a housing shortage. We have a housing shortage in the area. Let's build more housing here. They can't. Long Island, as a result, approves no housing. Um, and when I say no housing, I mean, New York City approves very little housing, but HUD has a little tool that lets you see how many housing units are permitted by county. Uh, New York, um, annual, and um, 2020 is obviously going to be a weird year. I'm going to do, I like doing it through 2010, but that's kind of neurological. So let's do Nassau County, and also let's do Suffolk County. That's, uh, that's the other one in Long Island. Uh, and just for comparison, I'm going to do the New York County. So restaurant 
Queens, New York, which is Manhattan, uh, Richmond is on Kings, which is Brooklyn, and uh, the Bronx. And let's also do Westchester. Oh, right, I need to say county total is what I want. Um, county total will give me the total per county. I mean, I can click on some of selected counties, um, which I will do later because I'm, because the city is going to be weird. So Westchester County actually did permit a little bit of housing because it, is, uh, it has a population of about a million. Um, so this used to be one unit per thousand people, and they accelerated to almost three. Suffolk County, though, has a population of about 1.4 million, so it was at best a little less than a unit per thousand people. And on the eve of Corona, half a unit per thousand people. Nassau, it's 1.3, so they accelerated just before and during Corona to about one unit permitted per thousand people. And before it was less than that. Now, the city, it might not look very clear, so I'm going to drop Westchester and I'm going to drop Long Island just to do, to do um, some of the selected counties uh, total. So not county total, but group name, New York City. There might also be a New York City uh, thing to click. I'm not sure. Um, so New York City. Uh, this number, by the way, is high because they passed a new law around here. Uh, so, the, so a lot of developers filed for permits in anticipation, um, but a lot of these units were not built. Um, so New York City has eight point something million people. So New York City builds two and a half-ish units per thousand people a year, and the suburbs build less than that, much less than that. This would say, but no housing now. Two and a half, you might compare it with sort of say, oh, yeah, there's a lot of housing, building lots of cranes, right? Well, I talked about Stockholm before. Stockholm builds almost, Stockholm County builds almost as many. Stockholm County, I believe, builds about, at this point, 17 or 18,000 a year, and a population of about two and a half million. Stockholm is not the Yimby. So the term Yimby was invented, I believe, in Stockholm, but, and Stockholm is one of the Yimby cities in Europe at this point. But the world exists beyond Europe, as we all know, and uh, because it's a good time for, uh, uh, because they, and because they haven't actually checked, we will uh, check this. Um, so there exists a part of the world that is neither the United States nor Europe, where they uh, lack vaccination. I think they, a few days ago, announced that finally they have 20%, I think, first, first dose, less than 1% second dose. 24 per day. This is a country of 24 million people. Um, for about a year, they didn't have any corona. And now they're getting Delta. Uh, and this is what Delta does to them. And uh, yeah, this is how they deal with uh, the, I mean, Delta. I mean, Delta only start getting out here. Um, so... These are people who are unvaccinated. So as you can see, there does exist a world outside the United States and Europe. This world is sometimes DMV, sometimes not. Um, so democratic East Asia is rather DMV, although Taiwan less so than South Korea and uh, Japan, mostly because its population is uh, not growing because like all of uh, rich Asia, it has very uh, low birth rates, and unlike Japan and South Korea, it also has very little immigration. Essentially, if they allow more immigration, they're going to get a, they're going to end up getting Chinese refugees. If they get too many Chinese refugees. Xi Jinping might think that China needs a new province. Um, so the uh, so the so in Japan and South Korea, it's kind of like they're they're Yimbier in Seoul. So remember how I said that before in New York they permit this. Um, the Seoul metropolitan area, which is 26 million people, but the same size as metropolitan New York with distant excerpts included. Um, so d don't compare that to the 20,000 thing. So compared to two and a half ish per thousand people, so metro area wide New York would be about 50,000, 55,000. Metropolitan Seoul, about 260,000. 
Um, I do not know the numbers for Metropolitan Tokyo. I know the numbers for the city, it's like Metropolitan Seoul. Um, no idea what the suburbs again. So again, there are places that build more housing. And uh, you might think, okay, what does it do? Well, first of all, Tokyo's population is growing. So is Seoul. Um, this is in contrast with the rest. Yeah, so wait, if a house lasts 100 years, um, yeah, okay, so for replacement, yes, but I mean, American houses also um, last forever, well past replacement, because they don't build any new housing in, in these parts of America. Um, but, um, but, wait, so you need, so, so a house lasts a hundred, wait, a house lasts a hundred years. Um, yeah, so you need a house, okay. Um, and at any rate, in Japan, they're building much more housing. And by the way, you might think, oh, it's because the housing don't last. No, the, the, um, the net construction rate of, about 80% of the construction rate of Tokyo is net not gross. Uh, it's net not tear. So demolitions in Tokyo are about 20% of new constructions, maybe even a little less. Um, so in New York, they need more housing. Uh, the rents in New York shock me. I lived in Paris two and a half years. The rents in New York shock me. Um, Paris, by the way, became kind of NIMBY. Not the city, the uh, mayor Hidalgo is rather NIMBY and very overrated as a result. But um, Ile de France uh, builds quite a lot of housing, which uh, this is the paper to read. But Jonas Freemark, uh, who is only peripherally NIMBY, a little bit too left wing. Um, and um, so this is so. But um, so as I said, it's in this as the city itself is very nimby, builds very little. Anivel only wants to build public housing in rich areas to um, annoy rich people, to own the libs, so to speak. In France, lib means something different, but um. The, but, but overall housing production is anemic there. However, in the inner suburbs, they build a lot, and it's on top of train stations. So the question is, what can New York do? So New York needs to just build more housing. I mean, it just has to. I mean, the rents are insane. They're worse than in Paris, a lot worse than in Paris. Way worse than in Tokyo or Seoul, even with recent cross-growth in Seoul. I mean, South Korea is growing economically. Of course, rents are going to rise. But I mean, Japan, for example, with weaker economic growth and also lots of housing, has falling rents. Um, so you want to be there, and this means you need to build more housing. So how much housing? You probably want to, you know, aim for Tokyo or Seoul. I mean, maybe even more, arguably, because um, immigration and higher birth rates. Um, so Tokyo and Seoul would be about 10 housing units per thousand people a year. So this means New York needs to find housing for uh, a total of about 85,000 annual units. Right now, 20-ish. What it needs to be is more than 80. Now, um, I think it needs more than that because again, immigration, higher income, um, higher birth rates. Um, it doesn't need like hundreds, it needs probably about 100,000 a year. So New York needs 100,000 housing units a year. And um, I'm not gonna talk about the mechanisms to do so because these mechanisms are mostly break the NIMBYs. Um, and they literally mean break. Like we're talking, I mean, basically, if it, anything that says community in it probably needs to disestablish itself. And so the, and so it has to be a top-down process. It's very top-down in France, probably top-down in Japan, especially, and I think also in Korea. In Sweden, it's a little more complicated. It's um, the, the tax incentives are like this, but they're only for a short term because housing is so expensive that new Housing is guaranteed to be for rich people, so um, it's good for the tax base. Um, and it's sort of people who whine all the time have stable and strong control. Um, and in New York, neither, I mean, in the short run, sure, but I mean, you need it in the long run. Um, so, and the whiners are even intra city, way more empowered in New York than, than in Stockholm. And so, what you need. Is to do that. So the question is where? Because again, we're talking about 100,000 units a year. Um, and remember, 100,000 units a year, that's 
like think how much of it is going to one building. So my shitty little old little tenement, which was a, on four bedrooms, um, one room per student. Um, I think if you remodel these as a total gut reno, you might be able to turn one of these four bedrooms to not even for not even a three bedroom family of size. I mean, if you, if you knock down and if you turn one of the rooms into like a living room, that's still going to be a very small apartment. It's a very um, that's uh, I lived on the other side of campus. I lived um, I lived here, and I believe that my uh, bedroom window faced in this direction on the ground floor. Uh, if I tilted my head, I could see a tree. In 2000, in the academic year 2007 2008, which was the last full academic year I lived there, I paid $800 a month for the privilege. Um, my room was, I believe, uh, 10 or 11 square meters. Um, bathroom, tiny kitchen shared with three other people. Um, so, um, to avoid this kind of situation in which the sort of money that over here used to get you an entire two-bedroom apartment and no longer does, um, would get you, I mean, one quarter of a shitty apartment is probably the same area as the two-bedroom here. Um, so yeah, you remodel the, but yeah, you can, but I mean, even if you do a gut, get a gut, uh, gut reno, these apartments are not family size. I mean, unless the family is very poor. These are, you could possibly turn them for like two half nights, maybe three half nights, maybe. Um, and how many apartments are we talking about? Four per floor, so 24 apartments. Um, now, these are buildings of different sizes. So this is a bigger building, this is a bigger building. Um, so just try to extrapolate how many you could fit if it's this density. Um, I don't know, one, and again, these are building, bigger buildings. Let's call it one and a half. So three, six, seven, let's call it eight, nine, 10, 13, 14. Um, and then you mirror the eight here to eight here, so it's 22. So 22 buildings. You can probably get 24 apartments in each of them. Um, that's 500 apartments. Um, so 500 apartments to a block. That's actually pretty normal density, honestly. Um, and, um, and again, these are, if people live in like any kind of comfort, these are apartments for two people. Um, maybe three people, if it's like a couple with a child that they've just had and they're about to look for a bigger place. Maybe three people, if it's a couple and they have a long-term guest. Like, I mean, you're not getting more density than that. And it's going to be a lot of single. Um, so... You're not in buildings like this. You're not squeezing a thousand people into a block. Um, again, 500 apartments, maybe, little, maybe even a little bit less, depending on function. Um, now you can do bigger, so you should not be building these size of buildings anymore. These are too small. That's the first. Thing. Um, thankfully, bigger buildings exist, even in the same neighborhood. Even I mean, even seeing a crane, so there's a new one. Um, now. Um, I can't tell how many apartments can fit because a lot of it, because at some point it stops being, it, 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 at some point it stops being practical, not because it's hard to build, because, but rather because the next best site is going to be on a different block. So um, on the avenues and the major east west streets on the upper east side, they allow very high density kind of success. I mean, they allow up to a floor area ratio of 10, uh, 12 within affordable housing bonus, which I think everyone has to take. Um, and this is right next to all the tenements, by the way. Um, are any of them pre law? No, I think they're all well, not pre law. Um, actually, the, no, these look a little offset. Uh, I think these look offset enough that there might be. Actually, these these might. Yeah, I, I can't tell. So, so New York architectural historians might know from just the colors whether these are pre law or old law. They're not in law. Um, um, these are definitely old. Like the ones that look like dumbbells are old, old law. Are all old law, so that means window in every bedroom fa um, facing the outside. Um, and then when people threw trash in these little nooks, they uh, the new law was something like this. So the all, all these places have to be big. Have to be either open to the outside or big enough that you could have a door and, and ground level to remove the trash. Um, so 
you do see a lot of big buildings, but not everywhere. And um, so this is Third Avenue, um, and it gets bigger to the east. Second Avenue has a thing. Second Avenue subway. And the DOD on Second Avenue subway was actually built. It was built decades before Second Avenue subway because it was the area was kept at the highest zoning category in the 1961 down zoning bill. Um, because it was anticipated that Second Avenue subway would soon open, so this area was treated as if it was on the subway, even though it wasn't and wouldn't be for another um, 55, 56 years. Um, so not all of these are redeveloped. In fact, there was a uh, lot. I know I don't know which one, but there was a lot right next to one of the stations on Second Avenue subway where they spent a lot of uh, money on making sure the building would not be destroyed by the construction of the tunnel right next to it. Um, and then the building, and so, and so they spent a lot of money on preventing it from warping to do ground um, settlement. And then they knocked down this building anyway for DOD. Um, this was a thing that they were doing. Um, I don't think in the grand scheme of things it's why Second Avenue subway was so expensive, but it's a piece of the puzzle, maybe a couple pieces of the puzzle. Um, so here, um, again, you can you can go big. These are not six story buildings. I, I'm not going to count floors. I mean, but the floor area the floor area ratio is ten. Um, so it's as if it's ten floors that are built up to to the max on the entire lot. So which is obviously not the case. I mean, there's um, so 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 you so the rules about the ziggurats are still in place to call the sky sports plane. Um, or sometimes you can uh, do a lot of, uh, do things that you can see a lot in uh, midtown buildings from the 50s that were not ziggurats, but um, uh, were just offset from the street so there was a plaza. Um, I'm going to look for a good uh, example. So I think this one is. So it's, you see, it doesn't so this one doesn't rise vertically. I mean, this one does rise vertically, but not from the street because there's a little bit of space um, for a plaza. So, th it's, so this is an example. Um, and. Um, so, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's housing point is not in which shape the building is. I mean, the sky exposure plane role is probably bad, but it's not harmless bad, not horrible bad. Um, and so, Floria area of ten. So first of all, it's only again only on the avenues, only on the east west, uh, only on the two way streets. So the ones that are in yellow here, not this one literally, but most of them. So seventy seconds, seventy nine, eighty six, ninety six. Um. And um, but again, the but again, you're never building building up to the maximum envelope because eventually you're going to replace buildings. Maybe it's going to be a bigger building. Maybe it's a bigger building where the part where, where the residents don't want to move. I mean, the, the real estate is very much an industry of connections. Why people loathe it? I mean, it's not. I mean, you get you gain an edge in this industry by knowing uh, by by hearing that someone uh, got divorced. Uh, and is looking to downsize because they can't afford alimony or something. I mean, this is how you do real estate transactions. You find who is in a bad spot and you buy their housing when you know they're in it, and then you buy their apartment or their house when you know that they're going to go a little below market. Um, because if you go to like random, to, to, if you go to a rando who owns an apartment or who owns a home, and you say, I will pay you market rate for the apartment. Why are they going to move? Or, or, I mean, moving is expensive. Moving is a hassle. They like the area, probably. That's why they're there. Um, so you need to always pay a little bit above market, whereas if you have these connections, you pay a little bit below market. Um, so, so it's a big thing in the industry. And again, it's one of the reasons people love it. There's always this gaining something from other people aspect to it. Um, but at the end of it, but, um, um, so, so the point is that um, acquiring real estate is not always easy, so there are always going to be some undeveloped or some underdeveloped lots. Um, and at a certain density, you're never going to get uniform. Okay? I mean, if it's if you do the density, so um, with these old low buildings that I was showing on the block that I used to live on, um, they're six stories, but again, you can you kind of see the offsets. You can kind of see that it's not fully. So this you can you can see that not everything is developed. I mean, there are small gaps in the buildings, but they're still there. So I think it's so the regulation floor area floor area ratio is three point four two I believe, um, but it, it's higher than this year because this is before that so it's probably on uh, the scale between the buildings. So it's probably about four ish floor area ratio. So multiply by two and a half. But again, it's not going to be practical. You're not going to actually get let's say fifteen hundred apartments in Manhattan block. 
So let's go ahead and watch that walk, uh, east side walk first, so three different times. Um, but a thousand might be, might be doable. Yeah. Um, five hundred again, done all the time. Um, but here's the thing: you're not going to start from here. You're not going to start. So there are two reasons why you're not going to start from here. First of all, is why do you ever? You're not going to replace four with ten because you need to buy out all these people. I mean, in this case, all these people happens to be Colombia, but okay, then you need to buy out Colombia, same thing. Um, and if you're Colombia, and Colombia, and, and you're Colombia and you want to redevelop, um, you've paid a bribe to the city council member to get them to approve your rezoning, as with the campus expansion, and you just are going to evict your grad students, still, this is housing you could have used. So it's not like, it's not going to be your first choice. Your first choice is going to be a lower density lot, um, or an undeveloped lot. So again, this is why you're never hitting max. You, even, you always go into these things. So, you, um, and citywide, you don't want to start here. Um, certainly not. First of all, because it's kind of dense already, and second of all, the train here, the one, is overcrowded. So, it, not exactly overcrowded because the because the train enters the city center undercrowded. But what it does do is that the 96th Street it dumps an entire train load. No, here it's 96th Street. At 96th Street, the one dumps load of people onto the two and three. And the two and three are already kind of are already crowded coming in from the Bronx and Harlem. And now they get even more people. And no, not this. This both the line. Um actually did the computation because uh, this is the right side where I'll one. Um so the, my face is going to cover a little bit. So um, these are the crowding levels that I imputed from um, the hubbound report, which tells you passengers. Um, it does not have a good crowding estimate, but this can be computed using um, the uh, using a study on the exact layout of the train um, that, that is used on each line. And so um, you can actually find crowdy. Uh, not crowdy, standy crowding levels. All of these have standees, even the least crowded line, which is the R, entering from Brooklyn, where it's doing a loop-de-loop, -loop, where there's a much faster version, which is the MQ. Um, you might notice the highest number is the 2-3, coming in from the Upper West Side. And this is from 2015. This is from before Second Avenue subway. So since then, this will have gone lower. Um... So this is the most crowded line in Manhattan. So you don't want to overload it. You don't want to do it here. This is not the best place to live. Oh, not the best place to live. Sorry, this, this is not the best place to build. Um, so where do you want to build? You want to build on the undercrowded lines, which we have here. I mean, we know what what to avoid, which is the two or three, which is this line. Um, and then it got, takes the one, the four five, which is this. Um, although with second half in a subway, obviously, what's crowded of town? And the L. The L is the weird one. The L comes from Brooklyn. Um, it's the only crowded line from Brooklyn. Um, but it's from Williamsburg, and this area is very gentrifying at this point. Now, what does gentrification mean? Gentrification, in theory, means the replacement of a poor with a richer population, but this is not what is actually happening with very few cases, of which, by the way, Bushwick is an exception. Um, what Gentrification really is is the integration of a neighborhood into the city. Neighborhoods that are said to be gentrifying, and Williamsburg is a very good example, are often neighborhoods that were never poor or that stopped being poor a generation ago. And this is also, I mean, so the term gentrification was on a common use then, but it is in retrospect applied to the Upper West Side. When the Upper West Side got rich, not Historically, so the Upper West Side was not, for example, a rich neighborhood in the 1950s. The Upper East Side, absolutely. Whilst we would think that uh, uh, we think that north of 96th Street is only for um, criminals, um, but um, the but the Upper West Side was working class Jewish, and then it became middle class Jewish. And this is a process of the integration of the group in question into white America and white New York. Um, now, there is exchange between these neighborhoods and the rest of America, because if you're, uh, if you live here in the West Side Story era, 
Um, if you live here before gentrification, if you live on the Upper West Side in the 1930s, definitely, uh, or, or in the um, 50s, you're, in the 50s, you start being yourself as an integrated American, but, but you still are a little bit strange to America. And uh, you, so you socialize among your peers. Your peers are other Jewish New Yorkers. So yeah, the, the, um, so you go here and other Jewish New Yorkers, I mean, it's, um, probably also you care about which type of Jew. Um, so if you're a German Jew, you probably don't want to associate too much with Ostjuden. Um, today, if you're a secular Jew, I probably are not associating with um, Haredi Jews. Um, but if you're a secular Jew, you in normative white European or white American. Um, unless you're also, unless you also happen to be a person of color, which very few Jews are. They exist, but very small minority of American Jews. Um, and so once this neighborhood, once this group assimilates and becomes proper white Americans, you don't you don't just socialize here. I mean you can move to the suburbs. A lot of them suburbanize because to be a normative American it's IRS to live in the suburbs. So you have a lot of Jewish suburbanization. And then exchange of population. Some wasps figured they can move here. Why not? Normative neighborhood populated by normative people who often move through the suburbs. And it's the same with Astoria, same thing. Middle class Greek American neighborhood, and then middle class white American neighborhood with a little bit of a Greek history. And maybe the people who stay in the neighborhood the longest with the strongest Greek identity bemoan that nobody wants to buy um, Slovakia anymore. Um, and they complain that it's gentrification, but no, it's just population exchange. Um, Williamsburg and Greenpoint, same thing with Polish people. Um, so these areas, So, and, and one of the important things about this, and this is something you can actually see on the history and the history of the New York State subway ridership. Gentrification in the, in the sense means more subway ridership. Why? Because it means you socialize with a city, which you reach by subway because the city is subway oriented, and not by walking or driving. Because by socializing in the neighborhood or in the or the neighborhood and a few other neighborhoods all over the city for people like you. Um neighborhood um so for example, if you're so 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 for example there are Chinatown buses between the Chinatowns of New York, Chinatown, Flushing, Sunset Park. So this is a more recent development, but historically both were same thing. Poles would go to Polish neighborhoods. Um there's even a song, there's, a, there's even a song, Take the A-Train, um, by black New Yorkers. So the point of the A-Train is that the, is on the same train you connect Harlem with bed -Stuy. Um So because Harlem and bed -Stuy, yeah, you take the subway between them, but if you only socialize with um, within, let's say, Harlem, so maybe not central Harlem, which is north-south, but if it's all of Harlem, then there's a lot of east-west, and maybe you do want to drive. I mean, it's Manhattan. So you probably don't have space to park the car, but sometimes, aspirationally, you want one. Um, and and, and that is also where a lot of local NBAs come from, because the local elites um, are not local people who are elites. It's local elites, um, which is something very different, because um, if you're, um, so if someone earns, if, if someone who earns $500,000 a year, so undisputably, an indisputably elite moves to a neighborhood, they're not a local elite because they earn it probably working in city center, in finance, maybe uh, maybe insurance, maybe, maybe media, increasingly maybe even tax. They don't socialize necessarily in the neighborhood, they socialize with their coworkers. So they're not local elite. So who the local elites are, they're people who are wealthy by neighborhood standards and socialize locally within a local community and they drive more because the subway it's about the city. It's not about the neighborhood, um, and so the and, and so to the extent that gentrification is replacing the neighborhood identity with a city identity, yes, it means there's going to be more subway ridership in a gentrifying neighborhood in a transit city. Now, in a transit city, it's an important condition because in an auto-oriented city, it's the opposite. In an auto-oriented city, to be a normal part of the city and socialize all over the city, you have to drive. This is the case in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, gentrification in East LA um, is associated with lower rail ridership, lower bus ridership, because why the hell would you take public transportation in Los Angeles when the car is always going to be three times faster than the bus? Um, so if people aren't getting, so if people aren't any, aren't poor any longer, they abandon public transportation. In New York, 
Sure, if you're trying to get, I mean, the, the cars three times faster than the bus is true for specific city pair, for specific month city pair, um, street intersection pairs, but these are the street intersection pairs that are likely to be on, uh, that are likely to be the least, let's call it city-like, because the city-like connections are mostly to job centers, like Manhattan, like Long Island City, like downtown Brooklyn. Um, so the places where, so the connections where the car is so much faster than any alternative are connections that are likely to be done by people who only socialize along these connections. These are, again, weak connections. New York is a transit city. Um, not as good of a transit system as Stockholm, let alone Tokyo, but it is a transit city. Norman, so, so the high prestige city um, jobs are not here. They're here. You take the subway, you don't drive because maybe a few people drive on these roads and therefore these roads are hella congested. The local term for the highway called the Long Island Expressway, it's the world's longest parking lot. I've heard this from people with no interest in urbanism or transportation whatsoever. This is how people in the area call it. Because Manhattan has about 2 million jobs. You're not serving 2 million jobs with a handful of road tunnels. Cars lack the capacity. So once you integrate, so again, this is an integrated development and transportation. Development means a large dominant city center, which is where high value production happens um, in industries that are very space uh, efficient. Uh, so, so they don't have large factories that go in very land intensive areas. These are things like finance, where you need to be, give people offices. Spacious offices, these are not, you, you, you don't expect people to uh, work at the industry of a, uh, of a meatpacking plant worker when they're, a, when they're, they're an investment analyst or when they're a programmer. But at the end of the day, it's an office. An office does not con consume infinite space. So these are places that want agglomeration, even with Zoom. Remember, the uh, companies and uh, the tech companies uh, have bought office space in Midtown rather than selling it in the pandemic because they expect that the return to the office is going to be necessary for them for productivity. A lot of the workers want to stay working from home, but the managers uh, prefer them working at the office for productivity reasons. Um, and so the uh, and and so so these are city elites. I mean, people who don't think they're elite because their bosses are more elite. They're city elite. Um, and when you put them in a city center, you need public transit because cars, because cars don't have the capacity. Cars are so much less efficient per unit of uh, right of way width, the right of way size, and even well, I, mean, so I, I think freeways are a little bit cheaper to build than uh, rail tunnels per uh, unit of uh, uh, per per space per unit of space. So so. Uh, but they're, but not by much. Um, and for example, by the time you're getting into like a six lane freeway, it's already exp more expensive than a subway, um, often by factor of two. Um, and so, the, and, and then per unit of capacity, it, it's not even close. I, I mean, subways are so much more efficient. Um, so the, um, so, so, so you need to have a transfer system, which again, New York has, New York has a subway. And remember, this subway, not at capacity. Capacity is about four. So we're talking about four or five uptown, which is no longer the case because second avenue subway exists. Two, three uptown, yeah. And the L, which again is the weird one, the gentrification issue in, uh, in, uh, along the L. You can even see it raising the subway ridership as it happens. Um, so if you can kind of see which uh, the, the, the neighborhoods that gentrified first, that would be... Um, the part of Williamsburg started having an increase in subway ridership in the 90s, and then as um, Williamsburg got too expensive, the Delta Harris kept moving out into Bushwick, which is again one of not many places where there is racial um, where there is racial displacement. Um, and you can kind of see with this displacement, even of poor people by richer people, the subway ridership is rising with it, just because the richer people are likely to be traveling to Manhattan where they're taking the subway. Um, so, um, so this is the situation with the L and the thing is the L is not, the L is in a weird situation because, um, the 
train for hours count on the Alice on Highest 19. Um, the, uh, uh, with, uh, there's this issue with the L, with it, which has bumper tracks, but even the bumper tracks can turn 26 turns an hour. The problem is electrical capacity. Um, so they're upgrading that very slowly and very expensively. Um, so, so this is maybe an area that is at capacity, so you don't want to build there yet, even though it's in demand, you will in other in demand areas. So here's the question. Are there in demand areas in the city? And remember, the city needs 100,000 housing units. Um, a Manhattan sized block gets you, you get to probably around 1,000 units of POD density. You need 100 blocks per year. Can you get them? The answer is yes. I mean, it's not going to be the easiest thing in the world, but it is possible. Where? So you might notice that all of these numbers, um, so because I'm doing uptown, then Queens, then Brooklyn, um, these numbers, with the exception of the L, are lower because Brooklyn is overserved. Because Brooklyn was bigger relative to the rest of the city when the subway was built in the 1900s and 10s and 20s. Um, actually, very little was in the 20s. Um, then, um, I guess two tunnels, um, but they were also two in Queens, um, relative to today. Um, whereas Queens has kept growing. So Queens is, um, so Queens uh, has very oversubscribed lines, and Brooklyn at this point is under tall, to the point that, for example, the R tunnel is only half tall. Um, the only one route that, sort of, that uh, so it essentially is a branch operational, um, because the W turns in lower Manhattan, so it only goes. Queens to Lower Manhattan, and then the R continues into Brooklyn. That's how below capacity this is. Or not below capacity, under fall, I guess. Um, but also right if just below capacity. Um, so um, all of these areas arrive for development. Now, this also includes, now, the, uh, now these lines are, some of them are a little more crowded than the others, so the R is the Biggest gimme, but the R, remember, will mostly just fit, feed the bridge. So the thing is, the R, it's not going to be visible here, but I mean, the R runs local on 4th half. Then at Pacific, it goes to decal, no, it's not decal, and then going, wending its way right through downtown Brooklyn. So Mattertuck, Court Street, Lower Manhattan, does Whitehall, yeah, up Broadway. Um, to con up to Canal Street, and the whole point is the N and the Q. Um, so the N literally runs uh, express next to the R here, and the Q comes from here, and then the D is with the N, the B is with the Q, and there's this kind of branching and recombination thing that New York desperately needs to stop doing. Um, and then from uh, not have again decab, they just run across the bridge nonstop decab to Canal. And the R goes like this and makes many stops. I believe it's a 10 minute difference, maybe an eight minute difference. So basically everyone here changes trains. Um, and so, uh, and not only that, they can even have a choice of where to change trains because Pacific Street, the site of Atlantic Park is called the Pacific Street Line. Um, the R is cross platform with a DN and uh, uh, DCAB it's cross platform with a BQ. So again, choice. Um, you can even go to 6th Avenue this way, not just Broadway. So everyone switches, and this is why at the entry to Manhattan, this is so wonderful. I think it's actually maybe fuller entering downtown Brooklyn, the same way that the one which looks very, which looks like one of the, which looks like the second most underfall line. This is entering the um, midtown Manhattan, whereas uh, it's much more crowded entering 96th Street because then it dumps, because it's a local train, it dumps all the passengers onto the 2 3. Um, you can see a little bit with the F, that, the, not the F, sorry, the 7. The 7 doesn't look, look very crowded because it is, uh, because this is entering Manhattan and the same thing, the 7 is just very slow to enter Manhattan. Um, so this is, so, so the 7 goes, uh, so, oh, it's, it's above ground so we can see it. So the 7 goes through the, uh, it's, a main, it's serving Northeast Queens. Um, so here on uh, Roseville and Queens uh, Boulevard, that is called the flushing line, and then it goes cross platform with the Astoria line, which is much shorter. But the Astoria line goes direct from Queensborough Plaza to Manhattan. 
the savant is very slow, very slowly wends its way through Long Island City. Um, if you're going to Times Square and you're here, you don't take the first one that comes through. You take the N and the W to Times Square. Um, if you're from the seven, you probably still switch. Um, if you're from the seven, it, no, 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 not if you're from If you're starting from Queens Robots and you're going to Grand Central, the seven is the one seat ride. The um, and uh, W makes you switch to the four, five, six at Lux, uh, at Lux and 59th. I think this, I think it's about even on time at rush hour with the expected wait. That's how, um, that's how slow the seven is. So people switch. And so the seven is absolutely overcrowded, not entering Manhattan. It's overcrowded um, at two places. So it's overcrowded entering uh, the station called uh, Jackson Heights because then people just change to the express EF trains to Manhattan here. Or, and then it's, and, and then the seven is, and then so the, so the seven is really crowded here, then empty, then it fills up, and it's again overcrowded here, and then it updates. So you don't want to build here, not as the first choice, even though I must stress Sunnyside is a really cool neighborhood. Um, there should be more Sunnyside. But here, the seven just stays under fall. So you want to build a lot here. This includes housing. This also includes uh, jobs, because then people will stay on the seven. Um, uh, the Amazon uh, project that, uh, after a lot of left-wing opposition, was uh, shelved, unfortunately, um, would have been around here, I believe. So not the closest to the seven, but people would take the seven and walk. Um, so a very good place for this. Um, so. Um, you want to do so. You see, there's a lot of small buildings here. These should not be small buildings. They should be huge buildings. Now, it's done to some extent in Long Island City, which is one of the few places in the inner part of the city that are building a lot of housing, but clearly not enough. Um, all of this is again next to the seven. So um, I actually know this area very well. So uh, my main co-author for uh, the transit cost project, Eric Goldwyn, used to live in this area. Um, so um, I uh, and, and then this was when he was in the process of moving. So in the in between period, he would give his apartment to visitors to to Marin. Um, I was not the only one, so I knew this area rather well. Um, and again, you can see development there, but it's haphazard, and eventually, nearly all of this needs to be just. So, um, but again, we're talking. You, you need a hundred thousand units a year. Maybe you, you get a thousand units of blocks. So yeah, these are some of the blocks that we're talking about. Uh, one, two, three, four, no, one, two, four. Yeah, that's what. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nineteen, uh, twenty-two, twenty-eight, about thirty, and uh, and the, the closer you get to Greensboro Plaza, year, the more you're competing with commercial. Um. So yeah, that's thirty. Few months worth of so you go on that that's a few months worth of city housing needs if you go really for up you might be able to get six months of housing needs here now sunny said again you don't want to do this because the seven but but commuter rail access commuter rail is always under fall because the people who write it are snobs who think that if they need to use the middle seat of the two plus three fitting then that counts as overcrowded. Um, the average, uh, I do not know what the average LIR rider perceives, but the average LIR trains, uh, the LIR train enters the Manhattan core at rush hour with some empty seats, um, some middle seats. So again, some of these are occupying at 80%. Some of them are occupied. I think the, occup the occupancy is like 85%. Same with Metro North. And there, uh, so this is, again, a transportation improvement. You need to make this a proper s -bomb. So that you need to run urban service. You need to run high all day frequency. You need to charge subway fares within the city. Um, and you also need to, for example, not have conductors because it's too expensive. Um, so you need, and that creates more capacity here. It's only the, so th these are trains. So the seven comes every two and a half minutes at rush hour. These trains, um, in theory, you can run them every 10 minutes, but probably, but, but, sorry, every five minutes, but probably every 10 until more tunnels are built. 
Um, even with even with eight side actors, you might only have room for every ten minutes and not every five. But if you, even if you're on every ten, by the way, these are trains that are twice the size of the seven, so fifty percent extra capacity. You can run them every five minutes, twice the capacity. So suddenly it means that you open up this area by, uh, and of course this is going to be a faster train. So by releasing people from flushing, um, you also open up capacity here. Um, so suddenly these areas open up, and and of course this with side. Um, which is an LRR station, and they are planning and opening an infill station right here called Sunnyside um, at the yards. Now, they should also build an infill station here called Sunnyside Junction so that people can uh, change to trains that go here. Um, but either way, that's more capacity if you let people take it for urban service. Um, so suddenly you can turn these also. Um, they also have plans to overbuild on the... Uh, on this. this is... I think about 10,000, 20,000 housing units, maybe. Um, so again, you, you go aggressive, that's to, that's to maybe three months need, uh, worth of, uh, of city housing needs, 25,000. Uh, now, wait. Um, especially if you, so if you can release people from the Safan, um, or if you can do some kind of de interlining, which creates more capacity here, especially, then suddenly this opens up. Um, now, this should be done especially if you're doing a LaGuardia extension, so then you're opening up these areas. Um, and again, a block, and you, again, you need 100 blocks for a year's worth of housing needs. Um, and some of these are actually decently well developed, so you're not going to be able to do it to these areas, for example, um, which are already kind of mid rise. I mean, it's, you, you might notice these buildings are sparser than the one I showed you before, like the courtyards are bigger. Um, this looks like Floria ratio. Five store building, maybe two and a half. Um, so that you might be able to replace with done, but not uniformly. This you might be able to. Um, if you start doing bigger towers, so not 10, but 15 or something, or 20, all of them obviously part of the is going to go. Um, but again, you're starting getting into fractions of a block. Um, so this area is decent to redevelop develop um, with, an, with not new lines, but things that can be done on existing lines with the interlining. This very good um, with LIR service here, here, and again, we're talking each neighborhood is a few months worth of housing needs, and the city has housing needs that are more than one year. And the real price is Brooklyn. Brooklyn is where the trains are under salt. Brooklyn is where the trains were built for anticipations of growth in the early 20th century, and Brooklyn is below peak population. By the way, so is Manhattan, but Manhattan is commercialized, the Bronx. Um, it's also below peak population, but um, the, but it's so much more city integrated that um, the lines from the Bronx to Manhattan they're um, rather crowded just because they pick up not just the Bronx but all of Upper Manhattan, all of Upper East Side, and Upper West Side. Um, but Brooklyn is under salt, so you take all of these lines and you just. So this is probably the best area. It's an area that I like calling South Brooklyn, but Stephen Smith. Tells me that nobody calls it South Brooklyn. Uh, historically, this area was called South Brooklyn. Uh, I do not know whether South Brooklyn was just these neighborhoods or also this, which is Park Slope. Um, this is distinct. It, it was because at the time the city of Brooklyn was just this before it was um, going to take over the entire county and then incorporate, getting into incorporated into New York. Uh, so this was called South Brooklyn. Uh, the subway line through this area from the 1930s called the South Brooklyn Line. I mean, they changed the name at this point to the Culver Line, but it was originally called the South Brooklyn Line, and it went up until Church Street, or here. Then it took the Culver Line.
in this block. Um, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit more. And this is with 50 story building. I mean, you might get a little more than 3,000 to be honest. But you're not going to get, I don't think you're getting 3,000 here with 50 story building. Um, 2,000, 2,500, yes. Um, and remember, city housing needs about 1,000, 100,000, 100,000 housing units a year. We're talking enough housing for about 200,000 people. This, very important to upzone just because it's so desirable and you want to start with the most desirable areas to upzone because um, supply and demand means that um, the city fills rich people to poor people. Yes, you can do gimmicks with affordable housing to change that order, but it's fiddling on the margin. Like you're um, not taking the apartment of the richest person, you're taking the apartment of you know, the, let's say the eighth millionth richest person and giving to someone else. Um, so yeah, this is really good. Um, keeps rich people here. They will pay higher rent for this. They pay taxes. Same here. Same here. Um, but again, this is th this is like the, these together. Um, charitably, about a week. If I'm very wrong, we're talking two weeks worth of the city's housing needs. But there are lots of blocks here, and suddenly these start piling up because suddenly these are two weeks here, two weeks here. I mean, so if you think of each block here of Browns and Brooklyn as something that could be a thousand and change units, um, two of these are a week, 52 weeks are a year. Um, and there are lots of these blocks, lots and lots of these blocks, right? Because um, even if you take out Red Hook because it's separated by a freeway, um, even if you take out the waterfront district here, which is also separate by freeway, although honestly, this entire freeway should come down. Um, and that opens up some land. Um, so this is what? Um, yeah, a lot of Brooklyn Arrangements were apartments and they were made into single family homes, exactly. But even when they were apartments, there weren't many apartments. I mean, you could always squeeze more people into apartment buildings that are not missing middle. So this is by the way, it's called missing middle housing. And there are people who will tell you that it is an inherently moral way to live. So these are maybe the upper end of missing middle. So these are called row, so these are row houses. Um, so a row house is when um, you have a uh, building that is attached on both sides, but is treated as a single family house. This is basically how people in London live. It's called two up, two down there because it's usually two floors um, and two rooms per floor. Um, but people who are more middle class might do uh, three, sorry. Um, and which is actually something that shocked me when I uh, visited London and uh, and was crashing with um, friends of friends and realized, wait, um, having stairs in your own apartment, it's not even an apartment, it's a raw house, having internal stairs and, have, and living in multiple floors is something that, yes, these are rich people, okay? These are people who work for Google um, or, or work in consulting, but these are, but this is the mass middle class. They're, I mean, maybe middle class, they're maybe middle class or however they, the, the people in London trying to pronounce it, but um, with like the posher connotations of that, but they're middle class. They're not tops. And what I thought was, and what in Berlin is something that is something that a CEO of a big company will show to his, his let's face it, not there his employees to wow them in London is something the employees at the high-end firm, uh, and again, it's not a high-end firm with 10 workers, it's Google, um, will have. Um, so I think it's the, some of them are broken into apartments though, um, not in London, but in New York. Uh, I do not know if these are. Um, these don't look like they are. Um, it's rich enough people that they have three apartments, um, they, they can have three floors. Uh, by the way, uh, if you've seen the movie Home Alone 2, um, high geriatric millennial, then uh, that is on the Upper West Side, the building that Kevin is booby trapping, but that is an example of a house. So it's people who are wealthy. Um, like the whole theme of these movies is Kevin's family, they're wealthy. Um, but it's but maybe it's not something that Kevin, I mean, I don't know to what extent the movies are, the movies are a class critique or anything, but... Um, the um but but it's like mass upper middle class more than anything um so uh and especially the raw house i mean it's something that yeah today is 
going to be an affordably expensive, but in 1990, no. Um, and so these are row houses, again, it's called missing metal. There are many examples of missing metal housing. Um, so this is a New York example. It's called, it's again, it's the row house. Philadelphia has the same, but different, but a very different kind of architecture. In Boston, it's a different kind. So in, uh, so again, I, I know that's Boston form because I lived it actually in Providence. So I'll show you the Providence form maybe, even though I, Providence is a lower density city, so they're spaced farther apart. And only in the inner neighborhoods in Boston, the inner neighborhoods have apartment buildings. Um, so these are slightly farther away in But the same principle. So the, it's called the triple decker. And uh, let me show you where I lived. Um, it's going to be a little hard because I think the building next to where I lived was an empty lot. But I think this is where I lived. Yeah, this is where I lived. I know, I know the roof. Um, so a uh, three-story building. You might know there are two entrances. Um, there's a car parking space. I think I had a car parking space that I never used. I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, the yeah, I lived here. I didn't live here. Right? Okay, now I'm. Now it confuses to what I think I actually lived here and not here. I'm sorry. Definitely not here. Because I know number four. Um sorry if I'm getting confused. But um so one apartment per four. Um and often uh so I lived uh, there alone and I think both the people uh but both the apartments above me were one person. Um it so I was on like a middle class, like lower end of the middle class type salary, like a talk talk. Um, I was earning 50k a year, but Providence is not an expensive city. I lived in a very large apartment by myself because I did not sufficiently calibrate downward my expectations of how low rent were after New York. Uh, in Cambridge, it's more common to live with housing. By more common, I mean I cannot think of anyone I know who lives in Boston without housemates unless they are married and then they live with a housemate who is their married partner. Um, and then they have children also, and maybe, and then they have, and they also live with the children. Um, I do not know a single person in the Boston, in, in like the, in Boston or Cambridge who lives literally alone. Um, and even like a Dink, and even Dink living is a big step. Like, oh, let's move in together without housemate. Um, and uh, but it's the same in Cambridge, and also it's sometimes common to merge two floors of the apartment, and then and then many housemates will live there. Um, not two or three, but maybe five, as a thing, or six. Um, so again, many different forms. They're sometimes used as an inherently more moral by certain urbanists who think that oh, let's replace the single family houses over here with missing metal. No. Remember how hard it is to uh, that we need to scrounge for housing needs. 50 story buildings. Now take the 50 story building, replace it with a three story building that's not built over the entire lot, floor area ratio of let's say one, charitably one and a half. How many of that do you need to supply even something remotely close to the housing needs? No, it's not going to happen. So it's going to end up spreading all over and then it's going to be uniform density all over. So people are going to drive because it's not going to be higher density near the train station, lower, farther out. Um, no, don't do that. I mean, sure, let people build more, but mostly let people build big buildings, not two-story or three-story buildings um, near the train station. So anyway, this is the supposedly missing middle, and I suppose because there's so much of it in New York. This does not need to be there, okay? Essentially, all of these buildings, the correct, the highest and best use form for them is the 50-story condo. Um, now, not all of them are going to be 50-story condos because, again, the um, land assembly becomes an issue. And, um, yes, the first developer who hears that development is liberalized will be able to get anyone to pay market rates. The 10th developer, yes. The 100th developer won't. So you, it's always going to be, again, starting from the people who get divorced, from the people who, who died and their heirs don't want to take over the apartment, with the people who went bankrupt for whatever reason, and then... Um, and then spread from there. Um, but over time, but, but again, the, the whole point of 50 story buildings is that you do not need to have all of this to be 50 stories to have about 2,000 people per block. Um, and so these are lots of blocks. Okay, let's go south of Union just because this is a straight ish rectangular thing in Proxlope. 
Um, so this is one, two, three, four, five blocks by three, four, ten. Twelve gets you to ninth street. Fifteen. Nineteen. Twenty-one ish, and then you're starting getting more. This is a hundred blocks. This is a couple more blocks. Uh, it's called Windsor Terrace. Uh, I believe there's a very active anti gentrification group here. It's also a rather wealthy area. Um, not as wealthy as Park Slope, but this is still like the nice part of the, uh, the uh, of Brooklyn, supposedly. Um, South Slope is also very gentrifying. Just again, go up. Um, uh, and again, this is also nice because you're right on top of the R, um, and you might induce people to even stay on the R, to some extent. Um, which is by far the least crowded. This is the F, which is more crowded, but still very wonderful. Um, now here, we're starting talking about, um, again, we're talking about 100 blocks. Yeah, this is about a year's worth of the city's housing needs. Here, maybe another month or two. This, I'm guessing, is another year. Um, the um, Brooklyn Heights probably get to a lot of months. So you do here and here and here. It's grounded, it's grounded a couple of things um, from corners of Long Island City, maybe a story, and then we're starting to talk. And then these are prizes. These are, again, multi-year prizes. It's gonna, you're going to have problems in 15 years, but that's a problem for 15 years from now. And um, I remember I said before the Upper West Side is overcrowded, but two and three are, but when, if you try to get people to stay on the one. So Lincoln Center is very good for this, and unfortunately, or maybe I should say fortunately, fortunately this is very well developed, which is a good thing. You want lots and lots and lots of development on top of the subway, especially when you're literally the first subway stop outside Midtown Manhattan. It also means in the future you can't redevelop as much, but you can always find places. Um, again, it's harder. I mean, you're not, I mean, I mean, these are public plazas. These are all kind of things. Um, but I mean. Like, okay, so maybe the church might have a star value, but these spots, yeah. I mean, th th these buildings, to, to use the NIMBY phrase, are out of context, and clearly someone thought the same, which is why, I mean, this is a crane. This is a, the, the, crane the crane's not going to build something like this. I, ma I imagine it's going to build something like this. So here, turn that into this. Turn this into this. Um, and... um. So maybe also near Central Park West because these trains are very underfold the locals. Um, and I would say the biggest surprise is actually the neighborhood that started NIMBYism, literally, which is the West Village, with Jane Jacobs and what is mistakenly viewed as her urbanism, where she was very NIMBY. She, um, so besides the fact that she took, that, that um, the the brownstone thing, I mean they don't they don't call brownstones in Manhattan. But it's the same thing. Um, she and her husband. So she was. So, so let's discuss Jane Jacobs. I may, I may have mentioned her in a video, maybe more than once. Jane Jacobs uh, was born um, in the late 1910s. I believe. I believe she was born 1917. I never remember. Uh, maybe 1916, actually. 1916. 1916. Died just before turning 19. Um. So she had graduated, so her father was a doctor, so upper middle class. Uh, she, um, and not even a doctor in like a very poor area, Scranton, which at the time was, a, like, I mean, mostly working class because everyone was mostly working class, but Northern industrial, not poor Southern city. Um, white, of course. Um, went to high school, graduated high school. I think half her cohort in America graduated high school. Not just, and didn't just go to high school. She went to college. She didn't graduate. Um, she said that she was bored by the uh, curriculum, but um, I think she did the equivalent of two years and not any college, Barnard. And she was a journalist, which at the time was a high prestige profession. Her husband, architect. So prototypical upper middle class gentrifiers who take a, an, I believe three-story um, apartment building and renovated into um, a single family, 
and uh, she complains that the neighborhood does not need big buildings because it would uh, become like the awful Upper West Side, which is a slum, and eventually even, and yes, maybe rich people are moving into the new buildings, but they will get bored and the neighborhood will become a slum. If you know literally anything about New York City, you know the Upper West Side is not a slum, you know that the main, the, the, like if you want the, the simplest response to what she says about Upper West Side redevelopment is, wow. Um, the village was spared this redevelopment, and said it is wealthy and exclusive without big buildings. The Upper West Side is wealthy and exclusive, but more people get to live there. The Upper East Side, actually even more, I think the Upper East Side actually has weaker rent. Like, I think it has fewer rent control people than the village and the Upper West Side. So this is also a big prize, because you see all these tiny, tiny buildings, okay? Keep the one that is the establishment shop for friends or something, because it's, um, because of, like, first value, but all the rest. By the way, um, so Friends uh, is Grove and Bedford. So the uh, building where uh, the establishment shot is taken is this one. And, and it's one of the bigger buildings. And in fact, the building that they're facing, the one where ugly naked guy lives, is small. So they live at Grove and Bedford. So there's this Grove and Bedford thing. But the building facing them, which is supposed to be a new condo, I mean, there's even, I mean, the, you see the interiors when Austin was there. Um, this is unrealistic. You want people to improve the tourist value. You want to improve the tourist value. These, these need to be bigger. These need to be big condos. And then you can pretend that these were also big condos in the 90s. So, um, so again, this building, again, maybe this building also can keep for tourist values, but everything else as usual. Um, and remember, these aren't even full blocks. They're much smaller than a full block. Um, and there are some, like, this is the size of a full block. So these are like half blocks. Um, let's look at how many people I can squeeze in here. And I'm going to use population densities rather than block density because this is too many blocks and they're very irregular. Um, and I can't even go all the way up because the meatpacking district wants commercial. This is where Google is. This building, Google. Uh, now, obviously, if this building is Google, this building either is Google Annex or Condo. Um, but again, this doesn't go, but, but eventually you need to start getting into uh, commercial needs as well. Um, because after all, these people need places to work. And of course, there's plenty of jobs, but New York needs physically more offices um, because New York right now has jobs for a city of eight and a half million people with suburbs. We're talking about making it bigger. We need more jobs for this. Um, so you do this, and um, let's go as far as roadway, even. Um, so let, let's do this weird gerrymander where we're going to include, um, where, where we're going to um, include things. I don't think this is called, this might be called cell. I think of cell as a sign. Um, although maybe that's no later than the cell. Um, honestly, these names are basically just marketing. Uh, I'm going to do a little gerrymander around this because there are NYU buildings here. Um, so this area is two square kilometers. Um, now you can do about 100,000 people per square kilometer with high rises. With like, I mean, beyond that, it's like uni you need to be uniform London towers. So the biggest um, building block in, in the city is it actually has higher built-up density than Colon, than Colon Walled City had, I believe. Very small margin, but it does. Um, the population is, of course, much lower because, as you might expect, living like this is very desirable. So it's rich people, rich people need space, and even poor people in New York. I mean, I mean Colon Walled City, I mean, Hong Kong, which is already the overcrowding capital of the first world. I mean, and this was 30 years ago at um, Colon Walled City, and it was very poor by Hong Kong standards. Uh, NYU, um, yeah, and so NYU wants more buildings for, um, campus, but, um, but my understanding is that, I mean, but, but it's not like there's any proposal to build high-rise residentially or anything block. I mean, everyone knows that, I mean, everyone knows that it's not going to even happen, so I don't think proposals even exist. I think in the meatpacking district, um, it's the residents that, that are being problems. So again, this is 2,000 square meters, so 2 million square meters. Two square kilometers, just a little less. You can get, again get to about so fifty thousand is 
vanilla, 100,000. I mean, it can point to you housing projects that are denser than that in New York. Um, and if plenty of space, something like London, like uniform London Terrace might get you, might, you might be able to squeeze 200, but that's an edge case. Um, and, and even that, I mean, I'm not sure. So, um, this was again a bunch of things on, um, for West and the South, especially. Um, yeah, you can squeeze more people into it. Again, this is 30,000 people, maybe, maybe even all that. This is about a year's worth of steady housing, converting all of this into high rises. Um, plus the, and then you want these. Uh, the, uh, there used to be a plan for a seven train station here, and it was dropped on the grounds that the area is already developed. Right here, no, that's 34, sorry. Um, which is why it's developed as Hudson Yard. Um, it is 34, it is, oh, oh, it is here. Sorry. Sorry, I thought for some reason. Sorry, no, so the plan was to build a station on the 7 here, and they said, and the real estate and in, um, interested in one Hudson Yard said this area is already developed because clearly this is very development. Much development, very dense, very dense. Wow. Um, instead, they went to the then unbuilt area around Hudson Yards where they built a bunch of office towers for which they had to forgive the taxes because, not here, uh, here, for which they had to forgive taxes because the area is too far away. They projected that this would be the busiest station in the system, even more than Times Square. Lol. What's the average in square meter per New York, in per person in New York? 50. Sorry, I think it's 50 because of one census tool, uh, which would leave New York with more than every single European country except Denmark, which is 52, and Luxembourg, which is actually six. Um, Stephen Smith, based on different data sets, tells me it's much less, it's 37, so less than Berlin, not much more than London and Paris. Uh, might be comparable with Tokyo. Tokyo is, I think, 38 with empties, I think 33 ish without empties. Um, and um, Seoul is 32. So South Korea, which is still 1.5 world, um, South Korea actually they, they managed to get Seoul to beat London. Which, uh, not, London not sure about London. London might be a bit more. Paris is with uh, is without empty. It's 31. So there's actually more housing per capita in Seoul than in Paris because Paris is kind of EMB, but it's very recent. It wasn't until recently. And uh, Seoul is still a lot EMB. -er. Um, and so Seoul and Tokyo have actually, so Hong Kong is still the overcrowding capital of the developed world, but outside Hong Kong, like if you say democratic first world or something, like at this point, Paris is the overcrowding capital. Um, and at any rate, so again, a year's worth of housing needs with all these, two, yeah, there may be two, um, maybe a year in Queens, I'm not even sure. You start getting out, but you need to, um, more, but then you need to start adding more frequency. Um, Brownstone, Brooklyn, and the Heights, which I don't think are called Brownstone, Brooklyn. I think when people talk about, about Brownstone, Brooklyn, they talk about this part. Um, again, you can, with this and this and this, you might be able to do two years worth of housing needs, two and a half. Right, because this, oh, Bowerm Hill, that's also a better fire name, where it used to be South Brooklyn. Um, and this is, I think it's, I think I gave a talk here actually, and it's a lot of these breweries. Uh, this used to be an industrial zone, as the canal might suggest. No industry anymore. Um, but there are some environmental cleanups that need to happen. Um, this area is very polluted, but I mean, they're already doing them because this area is very desirable. So from here, well, this is one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, if you go the fairway blocks. And so, just south of Atlantic, um, and I'm not even going to kill the freeway. Um, so up to the freeway, and this is three square kilometers. So this is about a year, a year and a half. And this is also about a year of housing needs. Um, again, with this, you might squeeze three. You might squeeze three. Um, and this is why, why I'm highlighting it really, um, that these areas don't have infinite supply of, of buildable land. And eventually, you're going to need to 
expanded system. But on now, so you start here, and then again you go to South London, and then you start doing this all over Southern Brooklyn. And Southern Brooklyn is huge. It's not terribly desirable because it's far, and it's very hard to change it with more subways because the subways aren't very fast. If we just do it south of the parks, let's not build through the parks yet. Um, if you do something like this, um, and that's just the subway reach, so uh, go up to, I mean, a little bit of no strand because you have to. Um, but let's say that Utica is not built and no strand is not extended. So you have to do something like this. Um, let's say Ocean Avenue. Is in there. Um, this is a lot of buildable land. However, it's buildable land that is, first of all, parts of it are already high-rise projects, but not many. Second, um, this is far. Um, by the way, this area is also the little four period. Um, it is kind of the prototypical of like the vestiges of like, Either middle class people who call themselves working class or working class people who call themselves middle class is a little bit um, confused in the city because it's, because it's far, so rents are not so high. This is, again, a lot of years of housing needs because why the hell would someone live here when they go here? So we're not talking about block density anymore, but again, all of this needs to go a lot taller, a lot um, denser. Um, and yeah, so you want to start with these areas. Bronson, Brooklyn, essentially all the cherish low rise areas. The reason they're cherished is because rich people moved there earlier and down zoned because they were snobs and they didn't want any change around them. Um, and some of them even turned them into kind of ideological justification with some kind of anti-state pro-community politics, but it's just them being snobbish. That's all there is to it. Um, so tell the snobs, you're, no longer, you're not sovereign. You don't like to move to Florida. The city will be happier without you. And again, turn these into high rises. Um, this again, Skip and Dell goes well. See this, maybe Astoria, um, with some of the interlining. Um, with the improvement of commuter rail, just open a lot more land, like in eastern Queens near the train station, where I mean, we aren't talking about block density anymore because it's going to be dense 200 meters from the train station, not dense a kilometer from the train station, and blocks. At the, at, the, at the scale we're talking about for Browns and Brooklyn, it's bigger. I mean, it's multiple kilometers. Um, and uh, and likewise here, maybe if you can decon uh, if you can decluster, decongest, not decluster, if you can decongest the seven with better IR service, then this area is very desirable, I think, through it as well. Uh, this also. Um, this also is, uh, well, this, this also has a lot of Asian immigrants who tend to be um, a very pro growth group. Um, so they like more development. Um, and uh, also, not just Asians, also um, Eastern Europeans. Um, generally, immigrants are high, uh, immigrants are, for, are, are a very big group, um, especially recent ones. So um, Puerto Rican immigrants from 30 years ago, not necessarily. But, um, um, but more recent Indians, Chinese, Russians. I mean, I guess the Russians, a lot of them are from 30 years ago, but, um, um, but more of them are trying to come, come to the city. Um, and there's still, I mean, people are still trying to move from Eastern Europe to Western Europe and the US. So that is definitely a thing. Um, if you expand the subway, this opens up. But I'm talking about things before you expand the subway. Now, again, you should expand the subway in New York because people need to get to work. And this is rather inaccessible even for the people who already live there. Um, but in general, the, um, there should be very aggressive duty. And again, these are the potential growth regions, which are in areas that are not going to congest the subway, um, even with very high density. The whole point of like of building here, or especially building here on um, on Nostrand, is these lines are already very crowded coming in from the other direction. So this is free. I mean, these lines are under full because some of them are forced to run more capacity just because just to match with the other side. Sometimes they even run. Symmetric because of that. They think we're the two or three, and that complicates operations. So filling, so all ridership areas is free for the system. If anything's good for the system. Now I'm not pointing out Bedside as a growth region because Bedside is a poor area. It absolutely should 
up zone is, but I don't think it's going to matter very much because yeah, some people are going to move in, but um, you offer someone here versus here, they're going to go here. Um, and again, we're talking about things that start from the top down. So it starts with so all of these buildings the first year are going to be hereditary all because it's 100,000 units and New York has more than 100,000 um, rich households that want to live there that don't or that want to move up um, within the city. Um, so this will be a bigger place, but it doesn't but it has a hundred, there are 100,000, there aren't a million. So after not many years, you're starting to get to the middle class and then um, or 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 getting to the uh, like not richest parts of the middle class, or not people who are working with at, at Google with 15 years of seniority, people who are working at Google with one year of seniority, or um, office workers who are not getting full salaries, um, and then you're getting to the lower middle class. And um, so, the, so the sequence again: you start from the richest and most desirable areas to up zone because, I mean, developers will build them wherever. I mean, they, they already fall on themselves, fall on themselves, no, fall on themselves. To, uh, the, to to get housing there when they can. So here you can create more brownstone profile. It's not going to be brownstone, but people don't care about the brownstone. I mean, they, they care about the location. Um, they say they care about the, brown, about the brownstones, but they'll cover if they're no longer brownstones if it's building from the 2020s and off the 1920s. Um, and so that, that's the main program. Again, remember, with better public transit, you can unlock a lot more for capacity as well as access. So this is kind of capacity with um, uh, with the interlining, and this is capacity if the LRR are better, but with actual expansion, you can go things like here, Southeast Brooklyn, um, or parts of Eastern Queens that have nothing. Um, or California Lottery is a good place for justification. Um, there's, I mean, but it should get a seven train, but it doesn't stop here. Um, so that's the main program. That's what the city should be doing. And but but it means it's not necessarily about integrating transportation with development, which in a very dirty way the city has converged on. It's more understanding that New York needs to be bigger. That a bigger city is a better city. It's kind of, it's kind of a weird thing. New York keeps talking about how its size makes it a great city, and then it doesn't want more size. Um, and by it, I mean the organic city is defined by the preferences of unrepresentative neighborhood notables and um, retirees and um, small business owners um, and, and people who've lived in the same neighborhood and worked in that neighborhood for over like 30 years, which is very atypical for the city, but they think of themselves as the normal, so if they don't like development, so there's not development. Um, and even though they create the city size or something, and they use expressions like only New York, they don't want New York to be bigger. They, they, like, they, they like how things are, and yeah. You know, so you need to get rid of the neighborhood interests and turn them into a city interest. Um, and, and, and not turn them into a and replace them with city interests. And then the uh, city interest, um, objectively speaking, is in a bigger city. Um, that's what you should be doing. And again, you can do it without overcrowding the subway. Um, not for 15 years, but for five years, sure. I mean, you do here, you do the village, far west side, corners of the upper west side on the one, um, of course, of a story with the interlining. Um, again, it, all of this is possible. It just requires the city to actually decide we like growth. Um, so, are there any questions? Um, so I'm going to stop here and take questions if anyone has any. Um, and I hope to be done in a few minutes, but this can be done in any number, in, in any time between in three minutes and an hour. I'm not, not going to go past nine. I'm going to go past 9 o'clock. So if anyone has any questions, please shoot. If there are more questions, we're going to cut this at, I think, 8.10. Oh, what about Staten Island? Too far. Um, you can upzone it, but I mean, the ferry is too slow. Um, so you know that I've been talking about a regional rail tunnel that goes... Where's my regional rail? This. 
So if this tunnel is built, absolutely. Um, but even that, not all. <coughs> not all of Staten Island, all of the parts near the train station, and maybe closer around, maybe a bigger area center of George. But um, the uh, but, but Staten Island is too far. I mean, I mean the commute is going to get too long. I mean, you can upzone it, but I mean, offer the choice between any part of Staten Island and Brownstone, Brooklyn. Basically, everyone picks Staten, uh, picks not picks Brownstone, Brooklyn. Which again, I don't like calling it Brownstone, Brooklyn because it centers its housing form where people don't care; they care about the location. Um, does it answer your question? By the way, if any, anyone has any other questions, just feel free to shoot. Otherwise, I'm probably going to end this in like two minutes. I mean, this weird situation where it's so hot outside that um, I drink three liters of water today and I'm still kind of thirsty. Oh, thanks for, for the question. Um, do you or does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, sewer capacity, I don't know. Um, I don't actually know to what extent the city has sewer capacity problems. Um, I know they're trotted out by the sort of people who also think that there are subway capacity problems in neighborhoods where it's demonstrable that there aren't any. Oh, meter squared numbers for New York, clearly. Uh, it depends on the source. Um, I think I managed to see census data that say 50 square meters per capita citywide. I cannot tell whether it includes empties or not. Um, Stephen Smith, that's Market Urbanism on Twitter, claims based on Pluto data that it's 37, I think, without empties, but I'm not sure. Um, and German cities are going to be in the for, or mid 40s uh, without empties. Um, without is always less than with because with means you're including the square meters of apartments that nobody lives in. Yeah, I mean, Americans have giant apartments or houses. I mean, the U.S. average is 73. Um, literally no other country that I know of gets that. Luxembourg is 66. Denmark is, I believe, 52 or 53. And, and, and other than Luxembourg, Denmark is the highest in Europe. Um, no, the, the Americans have giant houses in which they store cars and uh, random things. And uh, they work way too long to, to afford the, um, such houses, except that increasingly they don't afford such houses because America builds very little housing. Um, it's 39.59 with or without empty. So is that by, so, so, wait, so 39.59 square meters per person, is that all of the apartments in Curlin or only the apartments that people live in? Because it's based on a survey of all the housing units or on a survey of all of the people. And again, Stephen thinks it's not 50, but 37 based on a different data set. I think my data set is right and his is wrong, but I mean, he's on Twitter. Like you can take it up. I mean, I'm saying he's on Twitter in the sense you can take it up with him and ask him for, for clarification. I don't in the sense of Twitter is bad. Okay, I will look. Statistik Bauen und Wohnen, kurz Information, Bauen. Wait, where? Why am I not seeing it? Am I blind? Oh, here. Oh, okay, this is a. Uh, yeah. Probably. Yeah, we have giant houses, giant houses, and um, certain pundits that um, think that living in cities that are have giant apartments 
except the people don't get to benefit from these giant apartments because they have oversized living rooms and um, oversized kitchens and no private rooms. So there are no, no private apartments, they have housemates. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, the, and yeah, I mean, suppose that you were a mediocre moron and suppose you were US funded, but I repeat my call. Like, I mean, this is not an industry that encourages thinking. It is not an industry that encourages actually looking at the evidence. Um, these are people who can say something feels right to them and it's taken as, a, as something that's at least interesting rather than random intuition that is often wrong. So. Um, are there any other questions? By the way, you note know something about Hong Kong. Hong Kong doesn't build housing. I mean, builds some housing, but not a lot. It builds, I believe, four units per thousand people per year, uh, not ten. This is why Hong Kong is so overcrowded. Oh, it includes empties. Okay, so without empties, it's lost. Okay. Paris is 31 without empties. Um, I would be surprised if Köln is less than Paris, even though Köln is a poorer city than Paris. Um, my understanding is that German apartments almost never empty, it's like 5% or something, because the rents are very, like, like the, the rents here are a little below market, they fill too fast. Um, so, um, so people get stressed and the apartment, and can't make a decision about an apartment while watching, because, but well, well, you're not while watching, because someone else will take it. Um, whereas in Paris, apartments stay, I think in Ile-de-France, 15% of apartments or something like that are empty, or 10% are empty, um, just because they, they intentionally want to make a decision. Um, and before anyone says anything about these rates, I mean, you can't have 0%. People are locked in. Oh, corrected for new divorces. Yeah, but so are, German, so are French ones. Um, in France, the expression is carré, which is, I believe, at the height of a normal Um So if you're, if you're under an angled roof, then it's not the floor area, it's the area at a certain level, which I'm forgetting which one. I think it's three meters, but I'm not sure. Could be head height. Um, are there other questions, by the way, or random comments before I bring them closer? Yeah, New York has flat roofs. Um, I mean, also Americans almost never tell you the area you rent apartments in rooms, not in floor area in the United States. Um, you can ask and you can say, you can ask and people will tell you an approximate an approximation, but it's not but they don't cite the exact floor area. They say rooms, they show you the apartment, they so make a decision. Um, but based on eyesight, you don't count. All right, so I'm gonna end this. Thanks for watching, thanks for commenting, thanks for the questions.